Just to want to welcome everybody. My name is Colin Giles. I'm the head of the School for Animation and Visual Effects here at Vancouver Film School. Again, thanks to Elena for organizing this and running this in the background. And I'd like to welcome our esteemed guest, uh, Andy Walsh, who's coming uh, from us from Wales. Uh, well, this evening, your time. So thanks for being uh, with us here, Andy. I'll just do a quick little rundown on uh, Andy's bio. Andy uh, has uh, many years of experience in the industry an illustrator and concept artist, primarily working in video game industry, but also film and television and advertising, has worked with Skydance Interactive, Terraform Studios, and Warner Brothers, and on titles that included Ghostbusters Spirits Unleashed, I know the sequel's coming out soon, uh, League of Legends, and American Gods. Additionally, Andy has been featured in several times in publications including 3D Total, 3D World, Imagine Effects, which is an awesome publication, uh, and has been developing workshops for Nomen our friends down in California. So Andy, thanks so much for joining us today. Really appreciate you joining us uh, all the way from halfway around the world. Um, yes. And really looking forward to uh, digging into some some great information from you today. Thanks for having me. And I did used to live in Vancouver in 2008. Oh, well, you're a local. You, you know all the you know all the best bars in town then. <laughs> well, yeah, well, I, uh, I lived in English Bay, which was really nice at the time. Oh, yeah. English Bay is great. I also noticed you did a lot of work in Seattle, which brings me to, yes. well, really, let's just, let's just kick this off with a sort of a classic question is, why don't you just sort of, you know, with, with a lot of students here that are currently in school, the recent alumni, uh, they're in that position where you were in a number of years ago, which is just starting out. Maybe you can sort of tell us about those early Genesis ideas and uh, sort of inspirations for you getting into concept art, into illustration, into commercial art. Um, maybe just tell us a little bit about your journey up until sort of school and getting into the industry. Yeah. Well, it was like uh, being a kid and then I had a journey that started that way and then was like severed. So I like did art in school, high school and I was it was a small town in Wales. So you you kind of think that you're good, but I probably was terrible, but you're probably the best in your class or whatever. And uh and then I just got this impression that illustration, there was no such thing as digital painting back then. So I thought illustration didn't seem like a good career path. Uh, and then I uh, I wanted to make films. So I studied film and television design in college. And the only reason I think why I got into digital art was because um, when I was looking through, through the college and looking through the course and stuff, I was like, oh, I'm going to have to, the computer rooms were full. So if you ever wanted to do an assignment and back then, not every single person had a computer. I was like, I'm going to have to buy my own computer just so that I can participate in the assignments. Um, so I bought a computer and my friend uh, had a whole bunch of CDs that he just gave me and said, here's a whole bunch of software, <laughs> uh, which uh, is a bit naughty, but like um, I was suddenly like, okay, yeah, Photoshop and the 3D studio max and stuff like that. Um, really, I wasn't really intending on doing any of that, but I played with it and there was a program called Flash. So you could do interactive UI animations and stuff. And I'd always wanted to be in the games industry. I remember even as a kid, I designed side scroller games in 2D with my pencil and stuff. And so um, <clears throat> I thought, right, what I'll do is I'll get into graphic design and progress through graphic design somehow into game i had no idea how um and i ended up sticking around in graphic design for 10 whole years until i hated it um at that point i had actually moved to vancouver so it's funny how vancouver comes into the story plays a part um i didn't know at that stage i was like i want to get out of graphic design but what do i do and i was it a career um junction i was like what do i do with my life and i tried this is going to sound crazy what i'm about to say now i tried psychotherapy uh not not receiving it like teaching like trying to be a psychotherapist um i tried person i qualified as a personal trainer um and uh, i even tried being an online poker player <laughs> um so at a certain point, and when I was in Vancouver, I was like, I just, I still want to get in games though. So I literally went around knocking on doors. I don't think you can do that anymore, but I went into buildings and was like, can I have a job somehow? So like cheeky. And um, obviously not much came of that. So um, 
came back to the UK 2009, was still trying to figure out what to do and um, was really just going through it. And then I saw a video by Feng Zhu doing like a fantasy landscape painting. And I was like, wait a minute. When I was a kid, I wanted to create worlds and do all that kind of stuff. And here's this person doing it in what's making it look easy, unfortunately. And uh, so I was like, right, I was 32 by that stage. And I was like, that's what I want to do. You know, I want to be able to look back at my childhood self and say, this is what you're doing for a living, you know. And I tried all those other things. And this time I was like, I'm going to give it 10 years. And I'm not going to just turn around after two years and go, oh, this isn't working. I'm going to give it 10 years. And uh, only then will I, you know, see if it's worked. And uh, it's a funny situation because 10 years later, it, my career you know, during the COVID boom just took off. And I was like, I've made it. And all my friends were like, you made it. Because it was 10 years of just brutal agony. And then, of course, and you know then the covid thing kind of peaked and then brings us to sort of more or less present day you know i can fill in the the gap the blanks along the way but um more or less present day was uh sort of thinking okay so what's next and then i was in the middle of a one year contract which is like not realizing that the whole industry is burning outside of you and you're like da -da -da. So then I thought, I better check in because my contract's going to finish soon. What's next, you know? And so I, did, I was working for Terraform at the time. And I, so I hit them up and I was like, so how, how are things? And they were like, not good. And I was like, what? What's happening? So uh, that brings us to sort of present day where it's it's like, a, if you'd have talked to me a year ago, I'd have been like, you know. <laughs> so now it's like, oh, no, I don't know what to do. So, yeah, that's basically it in a nutshell. In a nutshell. Well, we'll get to the present day in, in a second, but what I am so impressed about your your sort of resume over the last decade then is your ability to kind of jump from different styles, different uh, genres, and of course, different media in terms of film and television, games and advertising. Maybe you can talk to us a little bit about how that has worked for you, the the networking, uh, you know, skills that you have to be able to, you know, jump from different studios, different freelance jobs, um, sort of the 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 boots on the ground hustle that you've as has also allowed you to get, you know, a, a level of success over the past 10 years outside of just, of course, your talent and skill. But I'm, you know, a lot of our students will look at this thinking like, oh, I just need to know how to paint and I'll, and I'll get a job. But I think there's so much more to it than that. Well, there is no, for me, there was no hustle. There was just, um, like there, what I kind of learned on it, uh, which was unfortunate was, um, I was like, okay, well, at uh, certain points, I'll just hit up this studio and I'll just hit up these people. None of that paid off because there's a closed door policy in every possible. They've got it like, you know, with duct tape that any little light that gets through, they'll just close it up. There's no way to get through unless maybe you're a student, which, you know, you know, if you are and you can get in on a, um, an internship, then there's some doors open there, you know. So for me, uh, I literally just had to sit and wait until people hit me up. And the only way that I could encourage that was through churning out work. So I think the only, um, that well, the main skill that I had was making work that wasn't necessarily the highest quality, but got people interested and got uh, attention, got people liking it. Uh, usually through um, my calling card is kind of like mood, bit of story in there you know um what i find interesting is that even today there are concept artists out there that i can look at their work and i can go that's way better than i'm even capable of however is it juicy you know is it gonna pull you in you know and um i think that was the edge that i always had so now i've got a ton of followers um but not because i'm the best um, unfortunately, that's not necessarily the best uh, best advice because you do kind of have to be the best these days to get the jobs and to keep the jobs. Because that's one, there's two different things. Getting the job is one thing, 
that's not the end of the story you know you have to keep the job and i have lost lots of jobs because uh, my portfolio is like da -da 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 -da, you know <laughs> and and then people come along and they go oh uh, great can you do all of these things and then i go maybe and then it turns out that i can't do those things um so it's really good i'm good with the pr marketing kind of thing but you have to then reinforce it um with strong fundamentals uh, unfortunately it's quite easy to make a singing dancing portfolio piece that doesn't necessarily have all the fundamentals in it so when you talk about i love that word juicy i might steal that um in terms of story content of the imagery that you're making i think if anyone clicks on your sort of instagram or your art station right now they'll see that yeah there's more happening in in your work than just technical know-how um maybe talk to us a little bit about your approach your creative approach to you know especially your own personal work where you know you're you're trying to maybe design something for your portfolio you're trying to build a body of work but you're also talking about adding something that maybe other artists aren't or aren't considering as as much which is the story content of it is there is there a genre is there like inspiration you go to are there movies or other artists um do you write uh, at all you know before you start your start working i don't well not necessarily um i i'm interested in writing um and it's I mean, some of it's like by mistake sometimes i'll just do a piece and i'll think oh, i really want to have this moment here and it'll go really popular and i'll be like oh how come and I'm like, and then it's in retrospect you're like right okay let's look at all these pieces this piece didn't really have a strong story oh, and then you you go from there um but you know uh you've just got to consider don't just make here's the thing everybody makes something and their goal, it seems, most concept artists, is to make it cool. And that is usually the metric, right? And you have to go beyond that. You look at the, the really successful, when I say successful, let's just measure it by, say, um, social media. And they've also broken out of, and this is what you've got to do as an artist. We'll probably talk about this later. You have to break out of the art industry into the wider world, you know. And you got um. Uh, do you know the name Goro Fujita? Yes, of course. Yeah, well, he just broke out into the world because all of the stuff was rich in story, you know, and um, you know, so you have to consider all of those other factors. What do people like? General people, not you know your friends and family, not other artists, because we'll just end up making a robot or something. But what about a robot that's like really sad and? Or, you know, there's something else, you know, so more so, than just. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You've got to, you've got to be able to dig into something rather than just presenting a, a general idea. What for the, for the students in, in, on this talk here, what, what is the job? Like when you're working in the studio, when you're working on a production, what are you actually being asked to, pr to produce? And I don't mean technically, I mean, or literally, I mean, what is the role of a concept artist in production in the bigger picture? Are you there to inspire? Are you there to um, create ideas that are going to be used? Or are you there to kind of be sort of a, a pollinator of ideas and grabbing different things and just seeing what works and, and trying to inspire other artists in, in the production? Well, no, like, uh, I don't want to sound um, sort of um, <clears throat> disappointing. Because maybe it just depends on what level you're at, really. Like maybe a senior concept artist might have more say, you know. I because how it works, what people don't realize, and I didn't realize, and probably didn't realize until years in. I was like, oh right, this is how it works. Um, as a concept artist, you don't come up with the ideas. Um, the creative director comes up with the big ideas, and the art director filters them into a consistent style. And then you and then you get the brief, which has already had the ideas in it. And you just visualize the brief. Um and and like a lot of the time, even if you yeah, and you have to understand this as well, you'll be working on something and you'll think, you know, this thing that they've had put in here just I don't think that's gonna work. I think this will work instead. 
and you will say your opinion and it will get completely ignored is the thing because it's you need to understand where you're at in the hierarchy um you don't really have the ability to say i think this would work you know unfortunately um and i think that's just a matter of maybe progressing and someday you'll get the higher job where you may have more of a say um and that's a tricky thing to understand as a content artist because it really I, I think it also depends on the job. Like if somebody says, look, we need a vehicle, here's the here's the rough inspiration. If you're a vehicle designer, you will have to come up with iterations, you know? So in that case, you would. And there, it's not as though there's no opportunity. It comes up from time to time. Um, and yeah, looking back, there's the few props, I think, are, the, are some of the ones where you're most likely to have a bit of creativity. Um, and I don't have much prop design in my portfolio, but in, my, in the last job that I worked on, there was a, a decent amount of prop design. And so in that regard, you could have a bit of a play, um, but it, but usually there is, there has to be, the brief has a, it's a brief, you know, you have to keep within that brief. You can't just go, right, well, I'm just going to throw dragons into this thing, you know. Um, there's a certain, there's certain parameters that you have to stick within, you know. But it's not yeah, they- wide open. It's very much a production job. It's it's it, it, in a lot of ways it does mirror what other artists are doing along the production. You know, as an animator myself, yeah, I don't get to just make all the bells and whistles happen. I have to fit it within some pretty strong parameters, and I think that is the pro- that's the professional side of the job um, yeah. is being able to respond to that. Yeah, it is pr- productiony, uh, more productiony than you think, as opposed to coming up with the ideas. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think. I'm just, I'm also trying to think like in Ghostbusters, that was um, a little wide, wider, like the, there wasn't too much, like I would do something and then they would come back with small tweaks. Um, and I was like, oh, this is kind of cool. Um, there wasn't too much. Um, um, there wasn't sketches. Um, so in in that job, it was fairly, I could pretty much do what I wanted um so it it can happen occasionally every job is different and some jobs they are tightly though like my last job the the uh, that I did with Skydance Interactive they would give you a drawing of where things were and you uh which you know to be honest sometimes I prefer that sometimes I just want to say you know you just give me the idea and I, and I will because coming up with an idea is, and iterating can be very uh, stressful. So uh, sometimes it's more comfortable if they just give you most of the idea and you just can comfortably get on with massaging it into, into something, you know. Yeah, there's a there's a sense of cathartic joy when you execute on someone else's idea and then they go, yeah, that's exactly, or it's even yeah. better than what I was thinking, but it's it's not some random idea you just came you just came yeah. up with. Because it can you don't you want to be able to get well, it depends, really. It depends on what you're comfortable with. I like to just be, have my day be comfortable as possible and not have to uh, um, just be running around going, oh my God, how long have I got left? Well, I like this. Oh, I've only done two, you know. So uh, so if they've done most of the work for you, then it's pretty straightforward. So we have one question here, which I think relates to that. And maybe this can just kind of be a, uh, an umbrella question about your career highlights uh, the question is from Anonymous. Uh, have you ever been in a role where you did create the story or brief? And if so, how how did that journey go? How did you get there? So maybe we could just talk a little bit about some of those big career moments, those highlights for you where you felt, yeah, you did have a, have a bit of extra input like Ghostbusters or uh, or maybe a role that surprised you. Um, I don't know about like coming up with, is that the main core of the question is like, do I have to come up with a, yeah, like were you the the author of the brief or a story? I, I would I was I would assume this question relates to production. You know, obviously in your own personal work, that's you're the yeah. you're everything in that role. <laughs> no, I don't know. Like in terms of like having um control over anything like that. I mean, no, um I don't know. There was one role that I had where the um CEO was just like, you come up with 
some stuff. He'd throw me a basic brief and we'll use it to pitch to investors and just whatever we can get for investment, we'll just you know go with kind of thing. And that was um, reasonably, I would pick up some ideas of locations of where we could do this thing. But um, but no, generally um, on any job, you're, um, you're, yeah, you're just given your instructions as to what to do. You're not really coming up with much from scratch yourself occasionally they might say um oh in this brief we don't really have much and that does happen i think um that, you know you'll have like brief after brief that is set and set and set and i go right this brief oh we don't have much it just has to be this um and those come up occasionally but that's few and far between so that leads us to the present day <laughs> and i think there's a lot of well, first of all, I just want to tell everyone this. Andy has an amazing YouTube channel, and I think you've been able to answer some of these questions that we're going to talk about. But also, you know, there's a lot of great tutorials, a lot of great information on there, a lot of great demos that Andy's providing just on the artistic side of things. But I think right now we find ourselves as artists, as, you know, just in our industry in general, at this sort of uh, crossroads, if you will, or a fork in the road or on the edge of, of some massive changes. Obviously, we're coming off of, you know the down the downturn after covid we're coming into this well you know we're we're all kind of caught up in the streaming wars which seem to kind of start every month in different ways and um that has had a huge effect on us this the diff, you know the double strikes of last year in hollywood there's been all these different factors at play and of course the other big one that's on our way is is the advent of of ai but also other software like unreal and and real time rendering and these types of things that are just changing how we work so my million dollar question to you, Andy, then is from today and, you know, standing on the, the edge of a cliff, both positive and negative, uh, what, what do you see the role of an artist and, and, you know, students who are getting into the industry now? Is there any sort of, you know, from your standpoint, things that they can look for, things that they should be aware of? Um, and, and yeah, really, and, and again, this is a big subject to talk about, but like, what, what is the effect of AI on, on the concept art world? okay so yeah what's um so yeah so we've got we, like yeah that's two we've got two things we've got the yeah. um the what looks like a complete collapse of the gaming industry which has and we've come the the film industry is coming back on its feet somebody said it'll take two years to recover but that's for production and post-production probably but pre-production for concept art and stuff i think that's the first thing that comes back so thankfully so in in fact the only um the only i i used to get uh reasonably regular inquiries when i was like say two years ago and a year ago um i would be hit up by regularly on art station usually by companies in china uh netties games were hitting me up every other day we're from a different source of netties games you know um uh but as of so just to tell you from my experience look at my portfolio bear that in mind finished my last contract in september of last year um i had a i don't count them because i failed both jobs and this is worth talking about um i got hit up and, and in fact there's several subjects i'm trying to fit into this one answer so i might branch out but i'll try and come back um you will think by the way you'll create a portfolio and you'll think i like these things i will make them in my portfolio and people will come to me and ask me to do those jobs i got hit up look at my portfolio i got hit up by the smurfs the people who make the smurfs right and it happens all the time but that's a whole other thing so anyway they hit me up and i said to them are you sure you want to do this <laughs> <laughs> and they went, we're sure. So that didn't work out. Um, that was so that's animation. Um, I then got hit up and I was so pleased with this, but then the job that I failed by um the guy, you know, the guy, you know, the Kung Fury movie. You, you, you see that? That's really, really cool. Got hit up by the director of that. Um and I was to work on his latest movie and I was like so excited. Um, so that's film. Um, and then I started on that 
And it was just the most difficult brief I've ever had in my life. So I tried and tried and banged my head against the wall and then they just let me go. I since was in, in touch with them and he says, oh, we'll get you doing some other work on something else later on if you want. So it's not as though they've completely turfed me out, but it we'll, we'll see if that happens. So that was so that's animation film. Um, and then recently we've had uh, somebody who's doing art in a in a an exhibition, not an exhibition like a gallery, like a an expo, and they need some artwork for that. And then recently, and then today, I got hit up by I, I, you'd probably call it advertising. It's a, something for a boxing match, a big level boxing match, um, like a, a a trailer or something like that. So nothing in games. Although I, I've got a, I've been interviewing at um, World of Tanks. But um, I don't think, I don't know. I'll have to see where that goes. And I got hit up by Epic. But they, but that was Fortnite. Again, all right? Look at my portfolio. <laughs> no Fortnite-related work. Um, so, the, so nothing's going on in games right now. And I think the people that in my, the, the last role that I was in, we've kept in touch. They were also scared. Um, so games is just dying um so you could only you should really be looking more towards animation and film that seems to be i don't but then again you've got displacements all the people who were in games are displaced now into the film concept art world so uh, fierce fierce competition um and so you've got to hope that games recovers and then i mentioned this in my video um is concept art finished uh and so, like, let's just say in two years' time, the games industry is back to where it was or something. Well, then what's AI going to look like in two years' time? Um, and it's we don't have to wait until AI takes all of our jobs. It only needs to take a certain amount before we're effectively those of us who aren't. And I, and I mentioned this in another video, why haven't I got a, why, why you're not getting job interviews? I use a, a level system count ranking yourself out of 10 it's good to know where you are on that scale you know the craig mullins is and the jamie jones is um uh they're all like they're obviously in the tens and they'll never be the Jam jamar joe rev and but like so where are you on that scale you know and um once enough jobs <clears throat> are, are taken if you're on that six out of ten you're not going to get in you know um whereas there are plenty of jobs this the six out of ten artists can get in so uh so it all and there's a so there's a question there in the chat saying um entering the industry as a challenge and even more so nowadays when do you think it's time to give up and the funny thing is i would go to expos and talk to senior artists and i would ask themselves ask myself ask them that question myself um and I did that the, the very first Lightbox Expo in Pasadena. Um, I went to that and I was like, I'm going to go to this expo armed with that question. I'm going to find my heroes, explain my predicament and say, should I give up? Um, so I, I, I was asking that because I've considered giving up several times, you know. Um, and I'm still considering doing something completely not well, not I'm, the pivot. I'm considering doing something like different but not completely different but if that doesn't work then maybe something completely different so um the problem is it took me 10 years to get here you know and it takes it can take 10 years to get good it's, if you're a genius or you're really talented and you've already got loads of skill it can take five years you know um assuming that you've hit you've got some background in art or something um but we don't have that we can't we don't have the luxury now of saying like i did okay i'll take 10 years to get good you know because 10 years from now oh my god um so that is the predicament that we're at and what i'm trying to figure out now like is what's the future and what should we do and i've got some ideas but some of it's just pure speculation, you know. 
what would you speculate in terms of like when you say something different as well like is that still in the artistic realm but maybe outside of film and television games even like is there a growth market for illustration is there an appetite for you know monetizing your own work being your own sort of like you know the art is you kind of spirit is there do you still find that there's there's a relative you know way to monetize your own your own skills without having anybody to lean on anyone else to lean on which is well, scary in a different way we have to do it is the thing whether you uh i guess whether you want it or not i feel like the only way that i could advise people who who are just like and maybe some of them are listening right now going oh no like I just, all I wanted to ever do was become an artist, you know. Um, it's just a painful that we, ha we have this AI thing looming over us because it's just ripping people's dreams apart, you know. With every iteration that comes along, it's just like a thresher just going straight through. The world of creativity itself is, is at stake. Um, gosh. Um, so you... So the industry you can't rely on. It's also industries are brutal anyway, and it can make you feel if you're not amazing, it can make you feel worthless. Um, so you have to really get out there and push with everything that you've got on social media. You have to become a business entrepreneur level social media. Um, like not just mm, I'll put my work on on Instagram and put a few hashtags you have to just become an expert at, at, at instagram an expert at youtube and watch many hours of how to get a million subscribers and treat it like a business and um the epiphany that i had today as i because i was starting to take no, notes down like right okay, i've got to write down what it is that I've learned, because I tried some experiments on YouTube to see how things would go, shorts, reels, none of it did well. Um, and I was like, okay, well, why? And it's like, it's because you're still trying to sell art to either artists or the general public, and not many people are that interested in in this world you know um in and so what i i came up with a concise way of putting it right when you're trying because you've got to figure out okay here's the things that i love doing here's what i want to sell here's what i want to develop create well you can't just pick your favorite thing um, and hope for the best because it might just be uninteresting to everybody um you have to basically here's what you're doing you are selling dopamine you you have a five to 15 second window and what you have to kind of do is go through your repertoire of things that you can do and it's, an, it's not the most beautiful thing but you to get in and then grow and then at the, when you're at the, if you get to the top then you can do your thing that you love and develop that you know but just to get in and start working your way up through the the follows and the, and the likes find your most dopaminergic thing that you still like doing and push in that direction you know things that just get people going oh wow within five seconds they'll just be looking like whoa that's cool you know as opposed to oh that's a nice nice picture no i don't want to buy your print you know <laughs> um and from there you if you grow enough you can start to monetize and you then have to start thinking again, entrepreneur, you have to start thinking uh, like, so I did two case studies today. Um, if I went with, I've got this. Okay. So I, on Instagram, I have posts that have gone pretty viral lately. Um, and I'm thinking, okay, do I double down on that? It's like a uh, cute scenes in the snow with a little mice and uh, people love it. And I like, it. um, do I do that? If so, how can I monetize it? And then I was looking at um, an obs obscure reference now, but you're all animation students, most of you. Do we all remember Salad Fingers? Do we remember Salad Fingers from the 
2000s. Well, the guy's still doing it, you know? And he's got 2 million subs on YouTube, which can, and 2 million subs can bring you in um, like, I don't know, about six figures, about a six figure income potentially. Uh, he's got 2,000 Patreon subs, which in itself is a six figure income. So, and he's got merchandise. So I reckon he could be, and you have to think about these things. You have to literally think, okay, what are the numbers? Because you can do art all day and you can be like, hang on a minute, I'm 40 years old and I'm earning the same amount of money as somebody who works in part time at a supermarket. And that's not good enough, you know? You've got, you can't, you'll get to, you suddenly turn around, you'll be like, oh my God, I have, I can't buy a house. I can't pay the bills. Um, my wife is from the Netherlands and I have certain financial obligations to, to meet with the visa requirements. Uh, if I don't meet them, I don't have a wife, you know what I mean? So you have to make money, you know, you have to figure out how to do it with art. Um, and that might be through something animated or something sound bitey, uh, something cute people love cute things i just saw a video today on tiktok is it um a little monkey having a bath and they're just pouring water on this little monkey's head four million views people love things like that you know <laughs> so uh you really have to think what is going to grab people's attention and would you say then uh there's a question here about like what are the best social media sites i i, I get a sense that you can't just choose one you have to also think of this as like diversifying your social media portfolio in the sense that it what works on tiktok might not work on instagram what works on art station as just a portfolio might not present on youtube so i would imagine even in your sort of case studies you're finding you have to be able to 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 monetize across multiple things well um TikTok feels to me like just too dopaminergic. It's too <laughs> like I tried, I put stuff on there. I got two followers after six videos and the videos uh, were like, you know, a few days each in the making sometimes. Um, so you do the math there, you know, you spend, uh, put it all together and it's like a week or two's work for two followers. <laughs> uh, so art is not, great on tiktok um but here's the thing right and this is this is my epiphany the salad fingers guy he can come up with something that is crazy that lasts in fact i looked i looked just before i got on this talk i was like okay let's look up how he's doing i know how he's doing on youtube i saw a short he's not got many shorts on youtube i was like oh i thought he had loads because you can sound bite that stuff and grab a five second weird clip that everyone's going to share because it's weird yeah um and i saw one of his clips uh it had somebody famous let's say i think it was prince charles or something like that i was like that's only got like one hundred and fifty thousand views and then i went on his tiktok and it had like millions of views and i was like right so it you, you, as an artist and an animator if you can get into animation if you can create something that is cool and five ten seconds long that's really interesting you can still then be an artist you know mm -hmm. but gone well i don't know gone are the days but i almost almost tempted to say that gone are the days where you can make a nice picture put it on instagram grow a following sell some prints you know i and the case in point uh the piece that i made that went viral got fifteen thousand views um and another piece like it got like eight thousand views and the prints are available on my Etsy and it's, it says in the thing, you know, and I didn't see any, almost, I don't think I saw any sales from that. Hmm. So you're going to be doing something different. You're going to be getting YouTube ad revenue. That's a great one because that's daily. If you can get the ad revenue. Uh, and I was pleasantly surprised uh, recently because I thought you had to get 4,000 hours in 30 days, but it's a year. So you got a year to get 4,000 hours um, and 1,000 subscribers, and then you can be a partner. And then that, that's daily money coming in. And if you grow and grow and grow, that's going to be steady. Whereas if you're a freelancer like me, you get no work for months. And it's terrifying, you know? Yeah, you've got to be able to... Um... 
yeah, in that case, you, you're what you're looking to do is create passive income at, at that point, which is which is a great position to go. So there's like there's like a, a light at the end of the tunnel in, in that regard. It's interesting yeah. what you're what you're talking about is, it, it, you know, when I look at AI or you know just kind of where we are, you know, that that looming threat is is similar in some ways to the camera was to painters, uh, and then we saw you know portrait painting, realistic painting, pretty much just became a niche thing. Um, to, even to, to to today, even digital painting styles. But what we did see was a move towards different kinds of painting, different like like a response to that. So yeah. do you see that there is a potential for a response to AI from artists? And and is social media the way is or is there a, a thing that's coming that we can't even necessarily think of yet? Because I think that's what happened with cubism and pointillism and you know these artists that responded to the you know invention of the camera as what was a threat to an art form completely became a whole new art form. You know, I loved disco diffusion. I would advocate for disco diffusion because it wasn't, didn't seem to be ripping anybody off. It came yeah. up with a really abstract, weird style and it showed you each step of the way. And I, and you would watch it and you go, Oh, I can see it emerging. And I was like, maybe if you painted like that, where you painted the early stage and then you worked it up and worked it up. Um, but that died. And so now we have, this, I think most, well, a lot of AI art is just ugly because everything is thoroughly detailed and perfect looking and yet slightly weird. Um, uh, but like, I've just got to remember the name of the artist uh, because he is an example. I don't know that I, I don't know that I like it. Um, let me just double check. But he is an example. Yeah. Ria Botvichev. <laughs> Or can I put, shall I put it in the chat? Sure. Yeah, that'd be great. And here's an example. Ria. Here's an example of somebody who's already, this is what's crazy. He's already an amazing artist and yet got into AI. Um, and so a lot of his stuff is augmented AI. However, it's cons it's a consistent world that he's building with it. I don't. I just don't know what to think. I feel a little bit like in two minds. <laughs> so if you can maybe already paint, I don't know how many um, people listening are really into fine art and painting and digital painting versus um sort of animations and and design and things like that but if you're really good with painting you could take a an ai painting and really augment it um use it as a middle point maybe between your concept because you know ai still needs to be prompted it's a static thing that you still need to be able to input some information into it and then maybe use that information on the back end i think there's there's some interesting uh you know, interesting possibilities there for sure. Yeah. I wanted to I, get... Oh, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, with it being currently text and anything like mid journey is no good. Um, I just wanted to say this, that it, mid journey is not a threat at all right now. Uh, anything that's text-based is just useless in terms yeah. of competition with concept art. When AI will get scary is when you can draw a crude picture and it will just fill in uh, you know what you want um right but to an extent ai has to get to the point where it's almost mind reading because as a concept artist you have to be so precise and then when you get that precision they'll say okay can we see it from the side right and then ai cannot do that right. so ai isn't isn't harming us yet it's down the line when it's gonna harm us <laughs> yes yeah and it'll harm many different industries i'm sure um but yeah i, I think it's 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 a threat and it's also an opportunity and, and we're kind of torn where both are going to both, both are going to happen. You yeah. know, it, it's just history has told us that same thing. The internet harms us and helps us. It, it's yeah. both, it's both ends of the spectrum, right? So we have to be able to, as artists, find yeah. our way within that. Wanted to get to uh, a couple questions before we wrap up our time here with you, Andy. Um, this one's from Casey. What is your process like when you set out to make a, a juicy image for your portfolio? Maybe we can have like a specific example of that because I know we've touched on that a little bit. But um, you know, how how do you come up with an image that goes beyond just the cool subject matter 
Is it your own personal viewpoints or is it response to outside influences? Um, and then the second part of this is how do clients typically find you and your and your work? But maybe we'll start with the first part of the question, mm -hmm. which is just talk about maybe sitting down to create a juicy image and what your process is and where you get your inspiration from. Yeah, um, it's it's very sort of quite tangible. It's like uh, if I feel like it's time to do like another piece, I have to. It's almost like um, taking in this big deep breath, and you like have to go. Ah, you know, because you have to get all of that um you can you you cannot make a substandard piece people don't quite realize this and this is i could talk at length about this as well because i since i made those videos i've been hit up by artists who are like oh what do you think of can i have a portfolio review and um some and this is why i want to impress upon people is you have to be much better than you are and the so uh, when I'm making a piece, I'm like, and in order, in order to be better than you are, you really have to just go for it. There can't be like a sort of a, well, let me just put this thing together. So, uh, and then you, you're building, at least I am on years and years of making something, thinking it's great. It's not. And you have to take that. And every time you take it, you go, and you grow a little bit. And it feels bad. So I'm taking all of those images after images after images that I've made that have just not been good enough and not been good enough. And I'm feeding that into like a system. And then as I'm massaging the idea, I'm going, no, no, that, no, we've done that. But that's it's not good enough. Not good enough. You know, has to be better. And so eventually it's like, okay, let's do this thing. And then let's take it to the next level let's make sure that it's got really cool stuff in it and not just saying okay well i'll download a temple and put that in and put a guy in the front holding a stick you know and every little thing you say okay well here's this little bit here i was just going to put a little crappy little stone here it's like no go into that little piece of the painting that's not quite good enough and really juice it you know if you've got a post-apocalyptic scene with a building and you're inside that building, don't just put in like a slight bit of rust in the ceiling. Make it all like chunky and falling apart and really go in and just make every piece of that painting have loads of fidelity if you're going for a big detail piece, you know. Um, otherwise, the other option, which is on the other side of the spectrum, is go for volume. So say to yourself, I'm going to produce... 10 pieces that are all adorable or something like that, that are just really going to be unique. And I'm going to take all the time that I would have put into that big, amazing piece and distribute them over these like 10 pieces. Um, but like, like have like uh, one day per piece or something. And that's my other tip is if you do that, you will get way more likes than on, if you put all of your stuff into a big detailed piece. And like yeah, like th that's cool because then you get to you get to kind of practice both in there too, which is actually a question I wanted to maybe as we start to wrap up here talk about a lot of a lot of people will put their work online and it's all finished. It's all yeah. it's all of that. That's it's it. all of that work that's gone into it. What do you have any sort of practice? Like, what do you do in the work that you don't show people? Uh, in the iterative process and in just practicing like oh I saw this artist do this thing I need to add that to my toolbox like I'm just going to practice that and I don't need to show anybody I think sometimes you know especially art young artists yeah. new artists they they get the pressure that everything they produce has to be seen is is there a process by which you practice and maybe even outside of like art skills yeah that's a good question I did that recently it's very hard because you have to like for me, one of the biggest downfalls for me is that I am terrified of sucking. Even if only I see it, I'm terrified of seeing it and going, oh my, are you really that bad? Because you, you know what I mean? Like if you produce something that's great, you go, oh, thank God, I'm, I'm good enough. Um, and I, and it, it's a practical thing. I just, I don't want to be good enough so that I'm, I can feel like I'm worthy of life. I just want to be good enough because I know that I can then get a job and pay the bills, you know, um, and go on vacation, God forbid. So, uh, so like recently I downloaded one of Jamar's tutorials and his brushes and see, saw if I could get some sketchy work going. Um, the sketching is the most important thing, which is 
you know, all, all of the stuff on ArtStation. This is like a grand secret that nobody talks about. They look at ArtStation and think, oh man, I wish I could do that. And oh, I wish I could do that, right? But the employers are going on ArtStation and they're seeing those pieces and then they're scrolling and they're going, where's the sketches? And I'm guilty of that. I'm the most guilty of that. I've got some, you know, but I tend to just go in for the kill because I want to get the likes and then the likes get you the job offer. Um, and it's not cool. And I, and I'm the, the worst for it. You have to show, you know, sketches and ideas and little bits of iterations on this thing and that thing. And so to show you how you arrived at the final thing, you know? Yeah. I love that advice. And of course that's the job you're, you're on your Monday, you'll be doing well, sketches. It, and on the Tuesday, you'll be doing more sketches and revising them and feeding, it, getting feedback. That's how I lose jobs. And I've, I keep, keeps happening to me where they'll say, can we just have some sketches first? And I'll go straight in for 3d. And they're like, mm. yeah. So but get, put the 3d down. Everybody put the 3d down and sketch. <laughs> get to the, get to the root of it. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Andy, uh, we're, we're coming up on 1 p.m. here, Pacific time. I uh, really appreciate you spending uh, part of your evening with us over there uh, in Wales. Uh, appreciate your honesty um, and your insight into what's happening now, what, where you've come from and where we could possibly go. You've given us some great advice. Uh, I think ending on just keep sketching is a, <laughs> is a good, is as good as anything uh, that you could do uh, outside of, you know, all the other topics we've talked about. So um, I, I guess... My last question to you, and I, you know, when I talk to other people in these, I like to end with this question, which is, you know, you you you've mentioned this sort of ten year journey. What would you tell yourself ten years ago that you know now to prepare for, or or just a simple piece of advice that you know would would have maybe made that ten years five years? Um, I see. Now, yeah, that that bit at the end it changed my. I was going to say just buy Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> um, That's no, true. Uh, Oh, would I? Um, I don't know that you can like uh, just keep failing and making, uh, realizing that your that your work is kind of sucky and um, compare like uh, people tell you off for comparing, but for me, the, you have to become amazing. You have to become way better. That's if you want to go through the route of quality as opposed to quantity or or if you want to go through the route of entertainment, um, which I am possibly going to advocate going forward. But if you want to go through the route of quality, it's the longest, hardest route because you're competing with the best yeah. and you and it takes time to get better. If you want to get really good looking results, what you have to do is do some work, find out. Find some of the artists who are in the eight, nine, ten category. Maybe not the tens because it's a bit overwhelming. And uh, some people, I feel like when I look at those tens, I I deeply know that I will never, no matter how much I work, ever get there. Mm -hmm. So there is such a thing as a innate threshold, I think. Yeah. Maybe. So something that is in, in the top categories, and look what you are, and compare the two, and how you. For me, how you get better is you when you look at your thing you think is amazing and then you go, oh, no, it isn't. And then you eventually feel revulsion. That is that's going to guide you because as you're painting, you're going to go, oh, it's not good enough. And that will make you. And sometimes you think, I don't know how to make this good. But I've seen me work on a painting. And I think this is not very good. That's good because then I keep going and I keep going. And all of a sudden I go, hey, hang on a minute. This is way better than I thought I was even capable of doing. It makes itself when you keep going, no, ugh, no. <laughs> Eventually you will get to the, the better painting, but you have to be real with yourself. Some people can't be. Some people are like, what are you talking about? I'm perfectly good enough. Don't do that because you won't get there. You have to be humble and compare until eventually you start to slowly feel like, oh, I think this is okay now. And then, and then you just get to do it again and, and build on top of that, which, which is, which is awesome. That's how you become better. And those, those seemingly failures are actually just part of a growth process by which I think a lot of people do quit at that point when they feel like they can't get to 10, but it's like, boy, if you can go from one to five, that's a huge yeah. leap. Right. So yeah, and as long as you can refine yourself by looking at the good stuff and instead of going, well, I, 
well as long as, as long as you can take the fact that you know that you suck and then you just keep pushing yeah. uh, it really is just about i think so much of it it can be boiled down to having a standard and not letting yourself drop don't just say ah oh, because you do it in your head there is a little voice that you're barely aware of that goes it's not enough it's yeah. not just keep going <laughs> keep pushing love it awesome well couldn't think of a better way to uh, end end our discussion today. Again, Andy, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you to everyone who joined us online today. Thank you again to Elena and to uh, our events team at VFS for putting this together. All the best to you, Andy. Uh, we'll keep checking in on you. Please follow Andy's uh, social media, his art station, Instagram, and of course his YouTube channel, which has a lot of great insight, a lot of great uh, touch points. Um, give him a follow. And uh, yeah, once again, Andy, thanks so much and all the best to you. Well, thank you very much. If anybody's got any questions that weren't answered here, then hit me up and I shall answer them. Awesome. What a great invite. Thank you again, everybody. Have a great afternoon. And of course, if you're uh, in the time zone that Andy's in, have a great evening. Thanks, everybody. Cool.